<laughs> Welcome this morning to uh, the Fall Honors Symposium. This is a most unusual semester, and as I don't need to explain to any of you, I want to, but I do want to express my thanks to everyone. Before we go further, if you can go to the next slide, we'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. We recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of Huichin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo Ohlone, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land and that it includes its use for research and student learning. Um, so uh, again, so th that's a pleasure to do, and, and also a pleasure, as some of you know, that we uh, are really expanding our, in the college, our role in Native American studies on the campus with hires of new faculty, and this has been really exciting. Um, but that's aside, that's another story. I'm just here to welcome the students who are presenting um, and uh, others, attendees who've come to listen, thank you. Uh, I want to really acknowledge, especially for all the students and all of their advisors, the extra effort that it took to do research under these circumstances, and I'm thrilled to just see it continue. It's amazing how well people have been able to adapt. I know it hasn't been easy, and I'm curious to see the combination of the work that was that was done remotely. Um, you know, anything that can be remote should be remote, and a lot of a lot of work has continued. Uh, and then also, you know, I know people have been in the lab and in the greenhouses and, and some of that has continued, that's been more difficult. So thank you all for, per, for persevering under these circumstances. And then a huge shout out and thanks to Sophia and to Anna for continuing to keep the honors program running strong. Um, and I will turn it over to them. So thanks so much. Thank you, David. And welcome everybody. Welcome to the presenters. Welcome to the faculty that joined us to support you guys. You are really the best that we have in our college. The undergrads that took the extra step and developed an independent research project. We are so proud of you. And I hope you can send this video if they're not live to your family so that they can see how cool and exciting your research is. I wanna give you some background and also give you the logistics of what's happening. Um, the research uh, that you will present stands on the shoulders of a big giant, Professor Tassio Mellis, uh, devised the honors program in our college. He started thinking about it in one year. It took a while to go through the Berkeley campus, and then it was formally instituted in 1995. The first student was a single presenter. There was one honors student in that year. And that first spring was the first symposium. But look, this is the first student in 1996. And then you see spring, spring, spring. And then eventually in 2005, students, as, as you guys are creative, why should you always have the last semester be the spring? So sometimes students start in the spring and finish in the fall, fall symposium. That's you guys. And the fall symposium starts coming up. And this year, you are this orange bar here. Last spring, we have one presenter here from last spring, thank God, she was still around, but a lot of them did not get to present. It was the highest uh, group of honor students. It was in spring 2020, and we were so sad, as I'm sure they were, and also so impressed that they just, regardless of that huge disruption in lab access, they were able to not only uh, finish their project, but have very exciting results. And if you go to our website, you can see the projects that they had. They're all listed for all semesters, and you have certain samples of these projects. Uh, the benefits for you is you will get honors in your major at graduation in, in CNR. The best presenter today will be awarded an additional honor, the Mellis Medal, and you have writing rights that you are honors students in CNR. And today, it is my honor to present the cohort of students. And if you wonder what number you are, the first presenter today, it's 770th. Um, remind me who that is. <laughs> Elizabeth. Yes, Elizabeth, you're 70, 770. Yan Ling, you're going to be 777. If seven is a number you don't like, we can switch you around because you have a lot of sevens. <laughs> um, so this is you. Elizabeth's going to kick us off. Then Lauren. 
then Katrina, then Chris, then Sonnet, then Ariana, then Jerry, and then finally Yunling. I thank and Anna and I thank all these amazing mentors and advisors from tons of departments. It can show you the breadth of our college. We have social scientists and we have the hard lab scientists. And as Dean Ackerley said, I am so impressed that despite the disruption, all these especially hard science projects were developed to completion. Again, congratulations to all of you. And before I give it to uh, Elizabeth, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Anna to formally thank her for everything she does for you guys. And she fights for you. She emails me about exceptions that you need because our main goal is not to grant you exceptions. We want to give you an exception. Our main goal is that you can continue research. It's about you. So Anna, I give you the floor to have the opportunity to say a couple of words to this amazing group. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. And, then, and we welcome all of you here today. We're excited to see all of your research and we're, we're looking forward to the first presenter coming up in a few minutes, but thank you for letting me work with all of you and for submitting this. And thank you for all the time that you put into this. We know that this has been a big commitment over the last couple of semesters. Without further ado, Elizabeth, you have the floor. Great, thank you so much. Let me just share my- You have the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so I will give you a warning when you are uh, five minutes to go. Probably I'll put it in the chat. Let's see if you see it. Five okay. minutes, do you see it? Well, if you see a chat, it probably means five minutes. If you're not paying attention to anything I say, I'll unmute and say, you're about to explode. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my timer going, so I'll be all oh, set. Thank and you so much. if you can all stick around, that would be great. But if you cannot, for some reason, let me just do something before Elizabeth starts. Let me just put it in gallery view and put you all here. Um, why don't I have everybody? So I only have, okay, Sonnet. It's going to take an official photo of us for the records. I was trying one, two, three, four, five, six. Why did I lose people? Okay, I'll just do this one now. All right, one, two, three, and then I'll Photoshop. You, you missed. It. You missed we can get it from the recording too, but let, let's go ahead with you, Elizabeth. You can yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything. You missed me going and round and taking photos of you guys, so I apologize. Um, okay, so uh, my project was all about the hormonal regulation of petal senescence in um, Ipomae purpurea, which is also known as morning glory. Um, and also, I'm in the plant and microbial biology department, um, and my major is genetics and plant biology. And just a huge shout out before I begin to my mentors, which were Ellen Sims and Noah Whiteman from IB and uh, Ben Blackman from PMB. So, so to kind of introduce what I was studying within morning glory flowers, um, petal senescence is something that happens in, in most flowers and it's actually just the essentially like closure of the petals and also wilting that you see with most flowers. And what's interesting in, in Ipomea purpurea is that this happens, the flowers open and then completely close all within one day. Um, so why is, why is petal senescence really important? And we can see that really pollinators are impacted by petal senescence because turgid petals that are completely open attract pollinators and senescing petals that are closing the flower do not attract pollinators as shown um, in the figure on the right. And so if you align, if the, the plant is able to align petal senescence with pollination, this can promote outcrossing, which would be pollination between different flowers rather than selfing, which would be the flower pollinating itself. So ethylene is really what I was interested in studying in this process because I had a hypothesis that ethylene would control petal senescence and uh, be able to impact uh, the, 
the alignment of petals and essence with pollination in the morning glory flowers. So looking at the more molecular side of this, the enzyme ACS, which is ACC synthase, um, becomes a really important player. And that's because ACS is the rate limiting enzyme in the ethylene biosynthesis pathway. And also it's a very unstable enzyme. And this is important because that means if you see the presence of ACS, um, it's very likely that ethylene is being produced at that time. Um, and previous studies have found that ACS is present in the stigma and style of the flower, which are reproductive organs. So it, therefore, it seems that the regulation of ACS has something to do with pollination since you see ACS appear in the exact organs that are involved in pollination within Ipomea purpurea. What's also important to know about ethylene is that it's a gas. And interestingly enough, as shown in the figure on the left, we can see that although ACS and ethylene, the ACS enzyme is present in the sigma and style in the center of the flower, the actual receptors of ethylene are in the petals. And so this kind of um, shows us that although ethylene is being produced within the sigma and style in the center of the flower, that the ethylene is traveling through the air in its gaseous form to receptors that are actually on the petals. So that could be then a way that ethylene is coordinating pollination with petal senescence because of this gaseous dispersal to the petals. So on the right, um, this is a little bit more of a zoomed in view of what's actually happening when ethylene um, binds to those receptors. And there's, there, the receptor keeps responses constitutively off in the absence of ethylene, but once ethylene binds, um, the receptors are able to trigger trigger a, a signaling cascade that can activate the responses to ethylene that could include, um, in, in my experiment, the focus petal senescence. So it's also important to know that ethylene sensitivity is observed over a lot of flowers um, that are closely related to Ipomea, um, including Pelargonium perturum, which is carnations, um, sorry, Dianthus carophyllus, which is carnations, in the Orchidaceae family, in Petunia, across the Solanaceae family, and also within Ipomea, which was my study system. So in order to actually um, test my hypothesis and, and really learn about petal senescence in Ipomea purpurea, I really had to grow those plants and do some experiments. So I first started out by germinating the seeds um, in the lab, and then I would transfer them to the greenhouses down at the Oxford tract, and grow up a lot of morning glory plants so that I could get a lot of flowers to do some experiments with. So my actual experiments um, it were, the main experiment would be these box assays where I created um, boxes out of clear plastic, which would be airtight and have the ca capability to hold two flowers. So the idea would be to emasculate both flowers day before the experiment, before the flowers opened, so that they could not self-pollinate, and then put two flowers with different treatments in each box. So the first treatment would be two emasculated flowers that could not self at all and were not treated with any pollen. And then and the second treatment would be having one flower that is emasculated and untreated, and then one flower that I've hand pollinated um, the, the day that I've put them in the box. And then the second or the third treatment is ha to have two flowers in the box that both have been pollinated um, artificially once they've been put in the box by myself. So this um, then, once we put the flowers into the box, the idea is have time-lapse cameras above the box to, to measure how quickly the flowers are closing. So the, the speed of petal senescence is then is measured by the time-lapse camera because I'm measuring the time that it takes for flowers to close. Um, and this is kind of a sample of, of the, uh, the video that would result. So the time I would measure goes all the way from the, the most open point of the flower all the way to right about now when the flower is completely closed and you can no longer see the stigma and style. So that would be the time increment that I'm measuring. And the idea is, is that if um, you have a pollinated flower in with a non-pollinated flower that you'll see an increase and for a decrease in the time that it takes for the flower to close or an increase in speed. 
of flower closure because ethylene is being produced, whereas in unpollinated flowers, ethylene isn't being produced, and so the flowers take longer to close. So um, these were results, so I'm one of the students from the spring, and so my research was unfortunately cut somewhat short, so I have hypothesized results due to the closures of the greenhouses. Um, so, and, uh, these, so these figures were generated with hypothetical data um, based on my hypotheses and using an ANOVA analysis. So I hypothesized that pollinated flowers would release a gaseous compound, theoretically ethylene, um, that would stimulate petal senescence and speed up flower closure. So I expected to observe a gradient over the three treatments that I had in the box assays in which um, the treatment with two unpollinated flowers that were just emasculated so they couldn't self-pollinate um, would take the longest time to close. And then you see a gradient um, of increasing speed of closure all the way down to the two pollinated flowers closing the fastest because both flowers would be producing ethylene and therefore they would, there would be a higher concentration of ethylene to trigger those receptors in the petals and cause the flowers to close a lot faster. Um, then if I, if the results um, showed, did not show this gradient and showed similar flower closure times across all three treatments as seen in the figure on the right, um, then that would nullify my hypothesis and essentially say that there was not a gaseous compound that would, that was affecting the petal senescence times. So to kind of conclude from that, um, if, if the, the figure on the left kind of shows the results that would confirm my hypothesis. So if these were the results that I had gotten from my experiments, then um, it, would, it would give me the information that there is a gaseous compound that is affecting petal senescence. However, that, that experiment alone would not tell me whether that compound was ethylene or not. So as a follow-up experiment, kind of future direction for the project, um, if getting this confirming result um, from the box assays, I'd like to do gas chromatography experiments in order to determine if the gas being produced is indeed ethylene. Um, and these are kind of experiments that, yes, you know, since the last spring, um, we were kind of shut down. I'm hoping to uh, proceed with this spring since um, the plants grow best in the spring, so I couldn't do it this fall. Um, and hoping to get some interesting results then when I can perform these experiments. So that's my presentation. And um, if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Yeah, we have time for um, one or two questions. So please feel free to either send them in the chat or um, speak out now. Yeah, we also have the Q&A, so you can put them in the Q&A or you can put them in the chat if, if there's any questions out there. Also, if any of the other presenters have any questions for Elizabeth, you're welcome to speak up too. I have a question and a suggestion. Um, you should try to team up with an undergrad in a lab or if imagine worst case scenario, you're not able to do it in the spring, I think you should still try to see if you can test it when eventually the greenhouses open up and then test and hypothesize whether what you were, your data uh, graphs will actually be the, the, the outcome. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely hoping to be able to do them um, soon. So we'll see, hopefully the spring is a little bit, a little, campus is a little bit more open. Mm -hmm. So what are your plans for next steps after graduation? Um, so I'm, I'm kind of, a, I'm applying to a graduate program to do um, a master's and then um, also applying to jobs. So just kind of seeing what opportunities arise. Um, but overall, I'm pretty interested in going into industry rather than academia. So um, very interested in, in sustainable agriculture and kind of the applications of plant science. Well done. And I think your advisor is here. So thank Ben. Uh, oh, Dennis. What, who, Dennis, I don't remember if he's here or not. No. Yeah. All right. So to keep us on time, thank, uh, again, congratulations, Elizabeth. And um, we give you, and it is my honor to give you honors uh, in uh, CNR for uh, uh, 
about your bachelor's degree and all the best wishes. And we turn now to um, Laura. Let's see. So Our next student will be Lauren. So Lauren, Lauren, you have the floor. Okay. Hi, I'm Lauren. Um, and this is, I'm going to present about the identification of amino acid transporters, sensing protein availability and hunger neurons. And I'd like to thank my faculty research mentor, Dr. Liu, and the members of the Liu Lab and my faculty sponsor, Dr. Oldsman, for supporting me throughout this project. So first I'd like to start about talking about hunger and how hunger is regulated. Um, so sensing nutrient availability generates nutrient specific hunger that is required to maintain homeostasis within organisms. So neurons regulating hunger, specifically dopaminergic neurons, regulate feeding behaviors. So we seek to understand the components of this mechanism and specifically looking at how amino acid transporters can act as nutrient sensors and regulate and alter feeding behaviors and metabolism. So ultimately, how does this apply to human health? Um, and the goal is understanding the mechanisms that regulate feeding behaviors will provide greater insights into mechanisms that could be implicated in diseases such as obesity, um, especially since obesity and the comorbidities associated with it pose a serious burden on human health. So in order to study this, the Drosophila model was utilized. Um, so specific amino acid transporters, the genes encoding those were knocked down and feeding assays were performed. And so during those feeding assays, uh, flies were allowed to feed for two hours and they had the option of eating either sucrose or yeast. And ultimately we were looking at seeing, do, does their feeding preferences and behaviors change from uh, their normal feeding behaviors if this gene encoding a specific amino acid transporter is knocked down. So now I'll get into the results of that genetic screen and the feeding assay. So there's a lot of data here, but this is more to show the, the spread of the data. So this is from uh, a knockdown of amino acid transporters in all neurons. And this was achieved using the NSYB GAL4 driver. And this is in only females. So in general, females tend to consume more protein and that's indicated by uh, values closer to positive one on these graphs. So a vast majority of the female flies um, tended to consume protein, but values closer to negative one showed a sucrose preference, which was different than their normal uh, feeding preferences. And so using this quantified data, in addition to looking at visual observations, so uh, the food that they consumed was dyed red for yeast, so to see protein, and then blue for sucrose to see sugar preference. Actually looking at the visual data, as, long as, as well as this quantified data, um, allowed us to determine there were 13 genes that could be potential candidates from this data with the female flies. And so this knockdown also was done in the male flies. And generally male flies um, have a sucrose preference and that is indicated by uh, most of the flies having uh, feeding preferences closer to this negative one value that we uh, determined. Um, and so generally male flies, they tend to consume less food than female flies. And so uh, drawing conclusions from the male flies, there's just not as many uh, potential candidates. So only one gene was determined to be a uh, potential candidate from the male flies, just because they do consume less food than the female flies. And so after these screens were done, uh, the genes were knocked down in a specific subset of neurons. And so this was achieved using the C2-GAL4 driver. And this driver, it knocked down uh, the gene in specific neurons, including the dopaminergic neurons, which are a hunger neuron. So this is, a, again, the uh, female flies. And so generally, female flies show a protein preference. Uh, most of the values are close to positive one, but the ones that do have a sucrose preference uh, we looked at as potential candidate genes and about 18 genes were determined based on this data as well as visual observations. And so knocking down this gene, uh, genes in a specific subset of neurons was also done for male flies. 
And in general, male flies have a sucrose preference, uh, but some do have a protein preference and those ones were looked at and considered as potential candidates. And so one gene was determined to be a potential candidate from this screen. And so after uh, the lab closed, uh, what one part of the project was looking at all of these genes um, that we determined as potential candidates and finding human orthologs for those genes. So then I'll get into talking about that. So after looking through all of the candidate genes, uh, I narrowed them down to five uh, very strong candidate genes, which are listed here in this table. And then I also have the human orthologs that were identified listed here. So looking through all of the human orthologs, uh, I was trying to see which ones occurred most frequently throughout all the potential candidate genes. And so uh, the families of human orthologs that uh, were the most frequently identified were the SLC6, SLC7, SLC25, and SLC36 families. And so I'll talk a little bit more about these four most commonly identified uh, families of human orthologs. So the SLC6, so I'll start with SLC stands for solute carrier transporters. So SLC6 uh, includes four subgroups of transporters, inhibitory neurotransmitters, monoamines, and two groups of amino acid transporters. SLC7 includes uh, two types of amino acid transporters that sense and transport amino acids. And both SLC6 and SLC7 families share a similar structural feature, um, which is this LUT-T fold. So that indicates that there are similar uh, regulatory mechanisms that occur within both of these families of transporters. And then another family of SLC transporters that was frequently identified was the SLC25 a family of transporters. And so these are mitochondrial carriers that uh, transport amino acids across the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And so the genes identified in the study, uh, there were two orthologs that were identified that corresponded with them, SLC25A15 and SLC25A22. And they transport ornithine and glutamate respectively. So ornithine and glutamate are both components of the urea cycle. So mutations in these two genes identified could potentially cause dysfunction in the urea cycle. And then the last family of, uh, that I identified was the SLC36 family. And within this family, there are four genes uh, that function as uh, amino acid transporters. And so in another study, SLC36 was also associated with regulation of neuron growth. And this was also in uh, a Drosophila model. And so ultimately, these strong candidate genes uh, that were identified should be tested further to, um, by running additional behavior assays and feeding assays like the ones that uh, were performed in this project. Also testing different RNAi lines uh, for each of these genes and directly observing the neuronal activities and potentially identifying the specific amino acids that are sensed and transported by these genes. So ultimately, molecular networks that drive feeding behavior metabolism are evolutionarily conserved. So hopefully this will provide a foundation for translational research in other organisms um, like mammals and hopefully humans. So understanding these molecular me mechanisms may help us have a better understanding of disease pathologies and uh, provide a basis for future drug targets and understand diseases such as obesity um, to a greater extent. And that's the end of my presentation. That's spectacular, Lauren. I have a very quick question that I put in the chat and you kind of brought it up a little bit in the end. Um, first, why flies? And are the insights you found in flies applicable to other organisms, uh, insects, mammals, completely different from flies? Uh, thank you. Right, uh, so flies are a, a really good model organism and because of conserved genetics, hopefully we can apply it. So that was the component of the study where I was looking at these SLC transporters. Those are the human orthologs. So hopefully looking at these genes and identifying them and how they factor into these feeding regulatory mechanisms can eventually apply to other organisms. So, um, Drosophila is a very uh, good model organism to start with and then moving to like mice and 
uh, many trials in the future. Any other questions? If you're a new attendee, also audience members, you can put your questions in the chat or the Q&A if you have them as well. Is there previous research on these gender um, uh, differences? Mm -hmm. Because that that has huge implications for um, you know behavioral and obesity relationships. Yeah, so those are uh, generally observed trends and just dystophila in general. We have a very quiet audience. Um, any any other questions from? Um, I know, Lauren, you're uh, on your way to medical school and uh, any, any interested in, in continuing on nutrition and ob obesity, you, you haven't decided yet, right? I haven't decided, but I really do like nutritional sciences and um, learning about how it impacts human health. So continuing some form of research in that field would be really interesting for me. You mentioned uh, environmental factors. So one thing I know it's kind of hard to do in the lab, but if you um, induce certain stress or uh, temperature or, because I, I know in the social sciences, there has been some research on the effect of temperature on how you eat, how you behave and make decisions that are not the best decisions. So it was something to consider expanding this work because you have kind of a lab setting. I, I, I know you should be not be manipulating flies and <laughs> but to the extent that you not completely annoy them. Um, just a thought to have additional treatments. Mm -hmm. All right, we can continue on with our next presenter then, who would be Katrina. Hi everyone, um, I'm Katrina and I did my honors thesis on volatile organic compound emissions or VOCs from agricultural burning and I was mostly looking into how they vary um, with crop type as a function of modified combustion efficiency and I promise I'll explain all that jargon um, soon enough. Um, my research project was part of an internship I did with NASA over the summer. And before I start, I'd like to thank my faculty advisor, Dennis Baldaki, who's here, as well as my NASA advisor, Glenn Wolf. Um, and I'd also like to thank Dean Ackerley for the land acknowledgement in the beginning, because I think one of the most important things I've learned at Cal besides the formal academic stuff is acknowledging how we benefit from stolen land specifically here, Ohlone land. So um, to get started, um, for some reason, okay, there we go. So the goal of this study was to look into what the drivers of variability are in emissions of volatile organic compounds. Um, and I hypothesized that would mainly be crop types. So what is actually burning um, as a function of modified combustion efficiency, which I promise I'll go into more detail about soon enough. So this is important because agricultural burning is understudied compared to wildfire burning. Um, and also most models that simulate emissions from fires don't take into account um, variability within the category of agricultural burning. So most models only have one broad classification for crop burning, but don't take into account any differences between different crop types that might be burning. So um, besides the fact that agricultural burning is understudied, the burning of crop residues contributes significant trace gas and aerosol to the atmosphere. And by furthering our understanding of variability within the category of agricultural emissions, hopefully we can build better models to simulate emissions and impact on air quality and climate in the future. So um, to go into some details about sampling, um, samples were undertaken during a campaign by 
Fire XAQ, which is a joint mission between NASA and NOAA to study North American fires. Um, and the um, aircraft that they used is called the NASA DC-8, which measures a variety of gas species. And these samples were collected in in situ in the southeastern US. So you can see on this map here, the paths in white are the flight tracks and each of these points is the location of the fires that were sampled and they're colored by crop type. And we sampled a total of 56 agricultural fires. And again, the variety of crop data that we have is significant because most other studies on agricultural burning um, haven't had available crop data to look into um, variability within the um, classification of crop residue burning. So as promised, this is modified combustion efficiency, a metric that's really important to understand for um, this study that I focused on. So basically modified combustion efficiency or abbreviated as MCE as a metric that is used to indicate to what extent a fire is flaming versus smoldering. So I have this image here. So flaming, just picture like your typical fire um, that's full of flames. When a fire is flaming, um, temperatures are a lot higher and that means that combustion is complete. Um, and so we would expect more carbon dioxide to be emitted. Whereas when a fire is smoldering and you can picture some glowing like embers, it's not fully flaming. Um, temperatures are lower and combustion is incomplete. So we would expect different emissions from a fire that's flaming versus smoldering. So an MCV value, MCE, excuse me, value closer to one indicates that a fire is more flaming, whereas lower values indicate smoldering. So in comparison, comparing MCE amongst our different crop types, we found that corn tends to mostly be flaming, most likely because it's drier when burned, whereas grass tended to mostly be smoldering. So another important metric to understand is uh, emissions ratios and emission factors. So the emission ratio is um, basically a way to measure the concentration of a certain species in the plume. In this example that I have here, it's formaldehyde. Um, and we quantify that by looking at the concentration of a species X, again, in this case, formaldehyde, relative to the concentration of carbon monoxide. And so in this example that I have in this plot, the emission ratio is the slope of this fit. And we use the emission ratio to calculate the emission factor, which is another way to quantify the amount of a gas species in a plume. Um, and it's defined as grams of a gas species X per gram, kilogram of biomass burned. And as you can see in this equation here, emission factors are a function of modified combustion efficiency. So when we looked at emission ratios um, for all of the VOCs that we measured, we looked at 35 VOC species total, and we found the highest emission factors for acetaldehyde, acrolein, glycoaldehyde, formaldehyde, and a few other species. So that means that these are the dominant species in the plume. This is what is mostly being emitted from these agricultural fires whereas the lowest emission factors were for C9 aromatics. So um, to look into the drivers of variability in these emissions, so we wanted to know why um, certain species were emitted more than others and differences in the fires that we measured. So um, we plotted emission factors for each of the VOCs that we looked at as a function of modified combustion efficiency. So you can see MCE here on the x-axis emission factors for, in this example, we have methanol, um, which is one of the dominant species in the smoke plumes that we measured on the y-axis. And we have the points here colored by the crop types. Um, I mainly focused on corn and grass because that's what we had the most available data for. Um, and so of the 35 species that we measured, 21 had um, strong negative slopes which indicates that the emissions of these VOCs that had strong negative relationships with MCE really depend on smoldering for high emissions. So for example, with methanol here, we would 
expect higher emissions um, when the fuel is smoldering than when it's flaming. And you can see here in this plot that the um, patterns for um, corn emissions here in yellow are a little bit different from that of grass emissions. So I'll show you another example with formaldehyde. And in this plot, you can see that grass, you can see the distinct um, modified combustion efficiency distributions between corn and grass. You can see most of the data points for corn are here closer to the flaming range, whereas grass is mostly in the smoldering range. And you can see for most of um, the data points that we have, we saw higher emissions for grass than corn. And we saw similar patterns with a lot of other species, especially ones that had really strong negative relationships with modified combustion efficiency. Um, so I did some comparisons to literature as well, notably two papers, um, Akagi 2011 and Andre 2019. Um, and what we found, so first of all, these two papers are syntheses of multiple other studies um, on agricultural burning. And some of, well, most of these studies actually didn't have um, available data on crop type or modified combustion efficiency. Um, and so when comparing our emissions factors from our study versus um, these other studies, we found that for some species, we reported much higher emission factors and others were lower. And I also compared um, emission factors from this study to emission factors from the literature. So I had this reference line with a slope of one, um, points in yellow for corn, green for grass, and circles for Andre 2019, and triangles for Akagi. And we found that our emission factors for grass were more similar to emission factors reported in the literature, which suggests that they mostly looked at smoldering fires. Um, so that's all I have. Basically, we found that um, emission factors show really strong negative correlations with VOC emissions, and we did find variability with crop type. Um, and we would expect higher emissions of VOC, such as formaldehyde and benzaldehyde, um, at lower MCE values, namely for crops like grass. So that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and I'm acknowledging here the people who helped me um, as well as people who provided data. So if you have any questions, let me know. Anyone from the audience have a question? If, if they don't, can you go back to the slide of um, the graph? Yeah. Um, um, more. Do you remember which slide number? That one, for example, that one, it, or, or that one. What, yeah. what, what is a, okay, that one. Um, <laughs> what, what is a point? Is it, I put it in the chat. Is a point a certain time and space observation? Oh, a re okay. Read or, because you just yes. have a regression. If you have panel data, you can actually control for a lot of things, right? So that, that's mainly what I wanted to ask. Yeah, I actually forgot to go over that. So each of these points, um, actually this will be easier to explain if I go back to um, the slide that shows um, how we sampled. So each of those points represents a transect, which um, you can see here we have, for example, these points representing these fires. And you can see by the flight paths that the plane intercepts each fire multiple times. This is because um, as the smoke is diluted in the atmosphere, chemistry changes. So instead of just um, averaging emissions for each fire, it's actually more beneficial to average points for each time that we intercept the um, smoke plumes. So um, if I go back to that plot as an example, um, each of these points is, um, represents a transect and the average emissions factor per transect. Chris has that's a question. Oh, uh, you yeah. have another question too. Oh, kind of related to question. Go back to your, um, flight, um, picture. Yeah. 
So I guess I was curious, what are the skill sets you learn in terms of dealing with these data? I assume you had to accept <laughs> and reject various data points as you were flying through the plume and not flying through the plume. Uh, was that one of the biggest challenges of doing this analysis? Um, luckily, someone else, not me, um, went through the data and um, identified which points um, belong to each transect. So luckily I didn't have to deal with that. But I think actually the harder part for me is that um, all of the crop data came from, wasn't collected by um, the NASA DCA aircraft. It was gathered separately based on ground surveys that were done after the fact um, and were identified using Google Earth and also some Planet Labs data. Um, and so actually one of the most time consuming parts of this process was identifying or was basically matching up which crops went to which fires um, since that data was gathered separately. So that involved looking at, I guess first, one of the things that was used was um, we geo-referenced some images that were taken by the DCA because they had some cameras as well, and also used some Planet Labs um, cropland data to match up the coordinates that we that were collected by the plane to um, images from Planet Lab that were taken on the same date um, to figure out what exactly was burning for each fire. Oh, perfect, thanks. Yeah. Chris, do you want to ask the question and then after Katrina answers, then you take the floor? Sounds great. Um, I noticed that the soy had an N of six and I just, it's such a common crop. Um, why is soy so undersampled? Whereas it's almost as commonly grown as, as corn, um, but it seems to have such a low number of samples. Yeah, so I'm actually not an expert on agriculture, but I would guess mainly because of um, the location. I'm not 100% sure, but for example, I know that um, rice is more commonly grown um, in other locations in like the North American continent. Um, and this, the area that we sampled, I believe is part of the Corn Belt, um, if I remember correctly. Um, so I think it would mostly just have to do with the location that we sampled. I'm not 100% sure though. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Chris, you go for it. All right. Um, I don't know why this is happening. What is going on? Wait, hold on. Ah, here it is. Okay. Um, so, uh, my, my name is Chris McCarran. Uh, my faculty advisor is Richard Dodd. My postdoc advisor is Angel Fernandez Marti. And uh, my graduate student advisor is Prolata Papper. And I studied for my honors thesis the population genetics of the serpentine endemic leather oak, uh, Corcus dorata. I also wanted to start off by uh, echoing what um, Dr. Ackerley said. Um, about Native Americans. I'm currently on Ohlone, Ohlone land and oaks were an incredibly important species um, for food and also cultural resources for the Ohlone people as well as Native Americans throughout California. So first I'm gonna begin by starting um, talking about a little bit about geology um, and also California's floral diversity and how this actually links into a single species which was my study species, uh, the leather oak, Corcus dorata, variety dorata. I'm gonna talk about some hypotheses and questions methods that I had, and then future analysis. So shown here is a rock called serpentinite. Um, serpentinite is the California state rock. And ultimately once um, serpentinite rock begins to degrade, it forms a soil um, referred to as serpentine soils. And these are renowned for their unique floristic assemblage in California. So serpentine soils shown here on the right-hand side, this is a serpentine habitat. Um, they're interesting for several reasons. So they're low in calcium and high in magnesium. And what I mean by that is that normal soils or normal soils um, typically have one parts magnesium to nine parts calcium, whereas serpentine soils have nine parts magnesium to one part calcium. 
They're also high in toxic metals like nickel, cobalt, and, cobalt, and chromium. And because of this, um, it makes it extremely hard for plants to actually um, exist in these soils. And so plants that occur on these soils actually have unique adaptations. And my study species, Corcus dorata, is a species that's entirely restricted to serpentine habitats. Shown here on the right is a map of serpentine throughout California in pink. And as you can see, it occurs in these scattered patches throughout the state. Um, and so they essentially create these landlocked islands um, for species and populations that are restricted to serpentine soils. Uh, because of this, they have a high number of, of very endemic taxa because they're hard to actually exist on. And so species that exist on serpentine soils often occur there because they can adapt to actually living on these harsh environments, um, but it means reduced competition. Uh, and because of their insularity, it means that there's a lot of rare species. And one good example here is in the genus Streptanthus, um, and that's shown on the right-hand side. Streptanthus has uh, almost 20 species that are entirely restricted to serpentine soils. And the reason that it has such a high number of species is because different populations of what were once the same species are no longer sharing genes between different isolated populations. And so over time, they ultimately speciate to become different species. My study species, the leather oak, is an anomaly. Um, as I pointed out, there are numerous genera that have speciated um, because of their restriction to these serpentine islands. Um, and my species is also a serpentine endemic. But the, the exception is that it's one of only two widespread species that are entirely restricted to serpentine habitats. Uh, the other species would be Hesperocyperus sargentii or the sargent cypress. Now, as you can see here with this map overlaid over its distribution, you can see that Quercus dorata with the, with the points in blue um, occurs on much of the serpentine soils and serpentine habitats throughout the entire state. And being that it hasn't speciated, really the question is why? Um, what's going on with Corcus dorata and its genetics between its different populations? Um, is this really a single species or is there cryptic diversity occurring? And has there been genetic drift that ultimately doesn't have any sort of morphological differences, um, but there are different genetic uh, populations? If it is a single species, uh, how much gene flow is actually occurring among these outcrops? And then also, what is the history of the species? Um, ultimately, there's two different ways that it could have occurred over such a large range in these isolated habitats. One would be that it was a very localized species um, and that there was a migration that occurred. And one hypothesis would be that Native Americans, um, because of food sources, might have actually spread the acorns. Or it was a widespread species that because of um, for instance, changes in climate or changes in uh, habitat dynamics ultimately moved on to serpentine and became restricted uh, as, a reduced, as a way of reducing competition. So this has several important implications. Um, first of all, for conservation, there might be genetically unique populations, uh, but also a species like Quercus dorata that's only found on serpentine islands um, it's not going to be able to migrate if uh, climate changes, uh, if, as global warming continues to occur. And so ultimately, um, the, if we're going to have assisted migration of the species, we need to actually understand what its genetics are. Also, understanding the past. Um, what, is the, uh, what is the reason that you can find a species that's distributed over such a large distance um, or such a large range? but is found only in these very unique habitats? And what is the influence of climate changes in the past on actually making this occur? And then also um, just basic scientific inquiry. Uh, asking this question expands our knowledge of California's flora and also expands our knowledge of oaks um, in North America. And so some methods that I used uh, for site identification, I used California Consortium of Herbaria records seen here. And ultimately what I needed to understand was that uh, so collections that occurred on serpentine and on public lands uh, would equate to the most viable sites. And so what I did was I used uh, USGS geological maps of serpentine habitats shown in green, and then also uh, California Protected Areas database maps um, shown in beige and also gray. And I queried with the ArcGIS 
And as you can see, um, there are sites that are found in public lands, but not on serpentine. There are sites that are found on serpentine, but not on public lands. And then there are also um, sites that are found on both. And so the most viable sites would be the turquoise dots. And then other considerations would be, for instance, um, blue dots, as well as the orange dots um, to inform where else I might be able to sample. This ultimately led to a sample size of 31 sites and 10 samples from each site would equate to 310 samples. Upon actually going out and collecting, I was only able to get to 26 sites, um, which led me to have 256 samples. Uh, once back at the lab, I did CTAB DNA extractions and oaks are notoriously hard to get DNA out of. And so this actually led to 26 sites with only 188 samples. Um, we actually just sent it last week to have reduced genome sequencing done. And they're gonna look at the nuclear DNA and we're gonna use the NovaSeq S4 to do reduced genome sequencing. Now, uh, obviously because of COVID, um, this led to numerous problems uh, actually going out sampling and then also getting into the lab um, to do DNA extractions. Uh, as I pointed out, uh, upon actually going, uh, getting into the lab and doing DNA extractions on my samples, um, I found that it was very hard to actually extract certain um, sample sites because of different phenols and uh, tannins in the leaves. And so I was going to go back out and resample from these sites. So I had more uh, an ability to actually increase my, my, the number of um, individuals that I was going to include in my study. Uh, but then the wildfires happened. And so I couldn't actually get out. Um, and then ultimately what happened is I waited because I anticipated, you know, I'll be able to go after the fires. And then I found that every single site that I need to resample from burnt. Um, so then there was that. Uh, so ultimately this led to numerous problems, but what I wanted to do here was ultimately just propose some, some future analysis that I'm gonna do. Um, using structure, what this does is a Bayesian analysis. And uh, this is from a different publication, uh, Cullingham et al. Um, but what they did was they looked at lodgepole pine and jack pine. And what they found was that, um, as you can see here, lodgepole is in beige, and then jack pine is in blue, and then there's a hybrid zone. And so this would be the sort of um, analysis that I would be looking to do among all of these different populations. Um, and I just wanted to also point out, uh, last night we had a meeting um, with my advisor, my postdoc advisor. And what's great is that we came to the conclusion that because I only have 188 samples. Um, that actually leaves room because the NovaSeq S4 can hold a lot more samples than that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to include a single individual of Corcus dorata, and we're going to be able to sequence the entire genome, uh, which is very important. Um, and this actually adds a significant amount of data to my study um, that I didn't actually think I was going to be able to have. So I want to just thank uh, my PI advisor, Richard Dodd, my postdoc advisor, Angel fernandez Marti, and my graduate student advisor, Pallotta Papper, as well as my Haas Scholars Fellowship advisor, Leah Carroll, as well as the funders of this research, because without them, uh, this would not have happened. And any questions? Well done, Chris. There's a couple of questions, so I will ask the people that put them in the chat to unmute, please. Richard? Uh, hey, can I jump in while we're waiting for Richard? Yes, please, David. Uh, um, Chris, this, this is going to be—it's going to be so cool to see the sequences. So, if I understood your second scenario, you were saying a widespread scenario that contracted onto serpentine. Does that require a kind of massive parallel evolution of the serpentine tolerance? I mean, that, that it's an unusual scenario, um, yes. and a pretty cool one. Yeah, I, it would. It would require like that ultimately hypothetically speaking I, I i wouldn't say that that was actually what occurred um my hypothesis would be that it was some sort of localized um thing that once again native americans or someone spread it but that would have occurred that would have had to have occurred in some sort of scenario where it was tolerant of serpentine and then maybe during the pleistocene or something like that um either climate changes or differences in um, ecological variables, maybe competition with other species, that if it was tolerant of serpentine, um, maybe throughout its range, it found a way to actually begin to shift onto serpentine as a way of reducing competition. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I think you have a chat question from 
um, Professor Dodd, but he's on the webinar and can't unmute. You can take a look. Oh. At Thanks so much. Um, let me see. Oaks are often referred to as multi species oh, man. taxa. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, so actually, so Prahlad is a, a student in David, Dr. Ackley's lab. Um, and what he found was that it's likely that the, um, its closest ancestor is Berberitifolia. And it's likely that um, Corcus dorata, as well as Berberitifolia, are actually hybrids of um, either, uh, I believe it's Gariana or Deglassii. Um, and so there, there might be, um, I would say that yes, it would be essentially a multi-species taxa. And once again, um, they, they love to hybridize. So it kind of comes down to what is actually going on with the species. Um, I, th th it very well could explain the anomaly. Um, really, I've had this question for several years and it kind of just, there's so much up in the air that Corcus dorata, it's just, every time I show up on a serpentine habitat, it's like, what what's actually going on here with the species? Um, so. Yeah, uh, Katrina, 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 go ahead. Yeah, um, oh, first of all, I'm so sorry that your site's burned. That's really sad. Um, but yeah, I was just curious, you mentioned that oak is difficult to extract DNA from, why is that? Um, they have a lot of tannins in their leaves and the reason what you need to have high quality DNA is to actually get sugars out of the different samples. Um, you don't want to actually have your samples have a high amount of tannins or sugars in them. Um, and because oaks are so high in these compounds, that the quality of DNA that you get out of them, I, I must have extracted some of the same samples probably about 20 times. Um, and I was ultimately unsuccessful in actually getting anything out of them. Um, so. Cool. Thank you. And great job. Yeah. Thank you. Well done, Chris. Sonnet, okay. you have the floor. And I saw that... Um, you have at least a couple of mentors in the house. So Bree's here and uh, I can't see the other panelists. So thank you for joining us. And we're looking forward to hearing your research, Sonnet. You have the floor. And I know your mom's watching as well. Welcome, mom. <laughs> thank you. Um, hi, I'm Sonnet. My project's called Accommodating the Anthropocene, Conceptual Metaphor and Ecopoetics. Um, it's an interdisciplinary project that draws on perspectives from cognitive linguistics um, and philosophy and in English and the environmental humanities. Um, so I want to begin with a quotation from Robert Haas about the relationship between poetry and other fields of knowledge. I want to make a case today that one of the roles that poetry can play is taking things that we already know kind of unconsciously or subconsciously um, in science and other disciplines and bring them to our attention in different ways. Um, so throughout this presentation, I'm going to build up this notion of eco-poetic, re renovative eco-poetic. Poetic. So that first word I'll explain, um, but eco-poetics broadly is the study of poetry that engages environmental questions. So one of the things that's kind of lurking in the back of our minds is the proposal by geologists that the present geological epoch is called, might be called the Anthropocene, um, which says that it's primarily characterized by the impact of humans on the earth. And I think what this suggests is that we, these emb embodied biological social beings, are intervening in diffuse and abstracted ways in deep geologic time. So acknowledging both the questions of subjugation and dispossession of settler colonialism and slavery that are obscured when we try to understand humanity as this undifferentiated undif collective. Um, I want to sort of ask this driving question of how we can understand the disjuncture between our immediate perspective and the diffuse impacts that we're having. Um, so to answer and approach this question, um, I draw on conceptual metaphor theory, which is a body of work in cognitive linguistics. Um, and the central claim is that meaning is fundamentally embodied. So metaphor is how we bring things that lie outside the realm of our immediate experience into tangible and human scale terms. Um, it's grounded in empirical research that suggests that when you, the source domain is activated, um, when you invoke a metaphor. So if I say I'm going to kick this habit, it might activate the motor cortex, even though I'm using kick metaphorically. Um, conceptual metaphor theory also tells us that metaphor is ubiquitous in all areas of human discourse. Um, it's particularly integral to science and scientific communication. Um, so it captures concepts like natural selection or deep time or genetic drift, as Chris was just talking about. Um, these are all metaphors. Um, another 
thing that I want to pull on from conceptual metaphor theory is this idea of a spectrum from novel to conventional metaphor. Um, novel metaphors are those that structure our kind of everyday unconscious understandings of, of complex phenomena. So here are a couple of conventional metaphors from climate discourse. Um, I'll pull on the example of carbon footprint, um, which is a really useful metaphor that lets us quantify and communicate about the contribution of each individual to carbon dioxide emissions. Um, but it's not a perfect metaphor because footprints are discrete and traceable and eventually get washed away. Whereas, so it doesn't account for the fact that emissions are diffuse and uncontainable. And as we know well, really hard to get back into the ground. Um, so the contribution that I think poetry can make is to recover some of what's obscured in these conventional metaphors that we need to use in other, in other domains. Um, so one of the ways it can do that is by recombining familiar domains in unexpected ways, like this example from Cody Rose Clevidence of the trees are the eyelashes of creeks. Um, another thing that poems can do is to actually re-novelize um, conventional metaphors. So um, this is an example of Ed Roberson invoking the word footprint, knowing that it brings up that frame of carbon footprint, but explicitly offering an alternative and maybe lesser known definition of the surface of wh over which a phenomenon exists. So he's kind of turning the, the concept on his head and suggesting that instead of the negative impact, it's also the fundamental substrate of life. So he's kind of re-inhabiting this defaultized concept with its plurality of sense and possibility. So this brings me back to this notion of renovative eco-poetics. Um, my professor, John Shoptaw, uses the word renovative to talk about poems that re-inhabit traditional poetic formal features. But I wanna argue that in the view of conceptual metaphor theory, um, as I just demonstrated, it's possible also for concepts, so the content of a poem, to be re-novelized or renovated as well. Um, and one of the components for this is this idea of embodiment that I talked about with the um, motor cortex activation and the sort of the ability of a metaphor to invoke, to put things in terms of the body. Um, and, and also this idea of contextuality in which poets are working, um, working within the scientific and discursive context that they're writing out of and into and complicate or trouble the assumptions that are embedded in it. So here's an example from Jory Graham um, using this kind of like economizing or capital, capitalistic jargon that's from the ambient culture. You can see here, I found it um, on Glassdoor is this idea of like economic growth. And I think in using these terms, she's both invoking the sort of ecological dimension. So growth as like bodily um, organismal growth, um, maybe accumulate backlog. You can hear kind of like log or um, the idea of decomposition in a forest floor. And I think consumer obviously is a, is a species role that an ecological concept as well. Um, and so I think that in also in placing these concepts in a poem that's titled self-portrait at three degrees, she's implicating the unspoken attitudes that this jargon is associated with or reinforces in the accumulation of the three degrees of warming that we are um, as of now approaching. And I also wanna point out this phrase, shapeless unspendable future that she offers. I think one another really conventional metaphor is the framing of time as money. Like I love to spend time with you or you're wasting my time. Um, and here she's framing this futural concept of, of time as unspendable um, and kind of troubling that conventional notion that we have of time, which is conveniently really kind of an underpinning of, of capitalism. Um, so another of the sort of um, sensibilities that I want to bring into this idea of renovative ecopoetics is this sense of ambiguity and simultaneity. As I talked about with the Anthropocene there, we have to be kind of inhabiting all these different scales at the same time. Um, and she talks about this as uh, the poem has always been interested in the immediate instant and the embodied subjective self. But I think this poetry kind of demonstrates its entanglement with deep futures and remote processes. Um, because unlike science, poems don't have to be deterministic and precise in the in the picture that they paint when they and they can recombine comment concepts and shed new light on them. Um, so I want to offer this poem um, from Jane Hirschfield's ledger. Um, it's called As If Hearing Heavy Furniture Moved on the Floor Above Us. As things grow rarer, they enter the ranges of counting. Remain this many Siberian tigers, that many African elephants. 300 red-legged egrets. We scrape from the world its tilt and meander of wonder as if eating the last burned onions and carrots from a cast iron pan, closing eyes to taste better the char of ordinary sweetness. 
I don't have time to give you a really close reading, but I wanna highlight the tension here between the titular meta metaphor, which conveys a sense of remoteness or detachment um, and the metaphor of the cast iron pan, which implies a lot more direct agency and intimacy with the subject of species extinction. And I think she tightens this relationship by including the words tilt and meander together, tilt like the axis of the earth, but also like what you do with a pan and meander both like observing animals, but also like the animals themselves moving. Um, it's also worth noting that the word extinction comes from the word extinguish, which relies on the metaphor that life is a flame. So I think that she's pulling on the sense of these, the burnedness and the sense of the extinguishment of life. Um, so I think that in offering this tension, she's kind of posing a challenge um, saying that we, we get to decide the level of immediacy with which we engage with and think about the kind of, on one level, very distant realities of the Anthropocene or whatever we wanna call this time. And I think, so on one level, our relationship can be voyeuristic or remote, but on another level, it can be one of felt immediacy. Um, and so I just wanna leave with a discussion of what I think poetry can and can't do. Um, I think that this, this project demonstrates the way in which language, in addition to scientific and technological solutions, is a site of intervention in facing climate change, global warming, um, anthropogenic forces, forcings, because it's a site of a point of access to our deeper conceptual structures. And so flexing or stretching those structures can jostle or challenge the assumptions that are lurking in the conventional metaphors that we encounter all the time as we look at headlines or when we're scrolling endlessly. Um, and poems can also, as this poem just demonstrated, bring scientific realities that are inhered in metaphors or terms consciously back into human scale. Um, because all metaphors rely on embodied human experience, but you can use them in a way that is actively relying on that, on that um, ability of metaphor. And I think what these poems also do is force us to take a really hard look at this reality. Um, there's a lot of ambiguity um, you know, the complexity of the climate system eludes even our best climate models. So we, we, we're trying our best, but we can't reliably pr predict everything that's going to happen. And a lot of times the best we can do is present a number of different outcomes that are likely. Um, and so I think that in resisting resolution, um, poems can enact this plurality of possible outcomes. And finally, this is an idea that comes from Jory Graham, um, the possibility that this ambiguity that we're facing understanding it less as um, a scarcity or lack of information, but rather as a site of abundance and, and possibility because our fate and the world's fate isn't yet sealed. Um, I just wanna end by expressing my immense gratitude to everybody on this slide, in particular the Wishek Fund, which um, sponsored my SURF Fellowship, as well as my advisors, Bree and Eve, um, and everybody else who's um, had conversations with me about poetry in the past year, um, and to you all for your attention. Thank you. I'd love to hear your questions. Well done, Sonnet. And I think it was uh, opening my mind to uh, approaching these topics from this completely different lens. Thank you for, this is like the beauty of teaching at Berkeley. You never know the, the angles that students go about. Um, and Brie, um, you have a question. So you have the floor, please unmute yourself. Hi Sana, it's so great to see the combination of this really exciting work. It's been a joy to be involved. I was curious because this part of your presentation focused more on the poetics. And I was curious if you'd speak just briefly on what you think scientists should do about how they communicate, given that you are thinking really deeply about metaphors and whether they're an accurate representation of reality. And that as scientists, we often don't even think when we say things like tipping point, like we don't even think that's a metaphor. So if you were gonna give like a short piece of advice to professors that wanted to try to be more mindful about how they're thinking about and communicating these metaphors about a changing planet, what would, what would that be? Sure, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think what's important, what's, what's interesting about metaphor is it, it operates differently in the mind of the, of the listener. So whatever, Kind of inferential structures you have when you encounter it are going to be activated in different ways. So a metaphor like tipping point for a biologist or a climate scientist, they have all of these inferences about how ecosystems can approach and pass tipping points. Um, but for like a person who doesn't have all of that inferential structure, um, it might have different inferences that are not intended or that are oversimplifying um, 
I think I've, I've observed a connection between the tipping point metaphor and this sort of apocalyptic framing that we often see with climate change. Um, and there are some serious drawbacks to that. Um, and so I think it's just, it's useful for people who are, you know, communicating their science to the public to consider what inferences, inferences people will have access to and what they might not do and might not, and then might need to be informed about or choosing a different metaphor that has kind of different um, sort of natural inferences. Yeah, thank you. Um, can I ask a question, Sonny? Sure. So, um, well, first of all, this was such a beautiful presentation and I love interdisciplinary studies and I really feel like we should stop separating um, disciplines into disciplines and communicate with each other across those lines more often. But one question that I was curious about since you talked about the power of language um, in communicating science and concepts and poetry, um, I was wondering um, if you had any thoughts on the broadness of the use of anthro and anthropocene um, and the implications of um, using such a broad term such as anthro to describe anthropocene when there's a lot of disparity within that term. Yeah, yeah, thank you for, for calling that out. I think that's really important. Um, and I think, I think one thing I would say is that metaphor, conceptual metaphor theory talks about how meaning is brought to the scale of an individual human. So I think there's a question about whether or not trying to scale up our imagination of humans to the collective level is actually useful because um, it kind of, it's like, I don't know how to think about that because I, I can just, I only have access to my own experience. Um, and I think also there's possibilities for different framing. So like Donna Haraway calls the Anthropocene, um, the capital O scene, plantation scene, Cthulhu scene. And so she, and I think that pluralizing um, the framing and adding kind of additional components can help complexify that and not totally el eliminate the problems that are inherent in trying to collectivize humans, but to recognize that it is humans and not something else that's causing all of these um, you know, changes, but also that there are kind of forces within that that are also contributing. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Sonnet. Thank you for I think the question, there's going Katrina. to be a couple other questions, but you can go ahead and answer those in the chat, Sonnet. Sure. We'll just try to yeah. keep enough time for everybody. Great. Ariana, you have the floor. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks, Sonnet, for that awesome, really cool presentation. So, um, today, I'm going to be presenting on my thesis about exploring climate change adaptation pathways for the Gunayala, who are an indigenous group in San Blas, Panama. And big thank you to my mentor and Professor Sofia Villas Boas for her help during this project. So, oh, um, some background on this issue and kind of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, the San Blas Islands are off the eastern coast of Panama, and on the 400 coral islands reside the Gunayala, which are an indigenous group that are extremely poor and have a um, very low international welfare index. And this will become important later. Um, some important things about the Gunayala is that they reside in an autonomous area and the Panamanian government has pretty much no control over governance in the area, which results in a very low data availability in the area, but also a higher vulnerability due to like, lack of infrastructure and lack of assistance from the government. Um, they are a really strong indigenous group that has kind of lived by themselves for many years, but face the threats of climate change because of their low lying elevation islands and because of um, both storm surges and sea level rise that I'll talk to a little bit about. So first in my project, I kind of intended on um, trying to find a way to model the migration of the Gunayala from the um, San Blas Islands as they will, we predict that they will have to eventually migrate. Um, so I did so first by looking at current approaches to climate modeling. So these three instrumental variable gravity models and coupled mobility and sea level rise models were some, in, some options that I explored. Um, and I wanted to make some observations on kind of what these models had to offer, but also what their limitations were. And I came up with three key observations as to um, like what I learned from the literature. And that's firstly, that specificity is essential for planning, particularly for um, in, in the case of um, an indigenous group that has so little resources. 
that data availability is a significant limitation to the type of approach you can take. Um, and in this area where the census only tracks even basic population data once every 10 years, that certainly was a limiter to my approach. And that current methods lack integration of cultural resilience. So the literature at this point currently um, tends to gloss over the perhaps the like resilience of these people and their particular adaptations with nature. So I wanted to, I developed a methodology kind of in concurrence with this analysis um, to couple a sea level rise and mobility model and indigen, in, integrate indigenous adaptive practices into a suitability analysis, um, which essentially determines potential relocation destinations for the Gunayala. So my methodology here was firstly to do a model of sea level rise based off representative concentration pathways 2.6 and 8.5 to provide a very conservative and generous estimate of um, sea level rise. Um, unfortunately, this 2.6 is you know, not really possible anymore given current emissions profiles. Um, so we're looking more at 8.5 as being realistic. I also looked at storm surges um, as a climate event that are going to become predicted to be annual by 2100 as a main driver of migration, notably that not just climate processes like sea level rise will affect these islands, but the extreme flooding that is likely to happen due to weather shifts and the sea level rise as well. So then I secondarily developed a suitability analysis for relocation um, that took it kind of calculated the um, viability of different areas in Panama for relocation based off of the following opportunities and constraints. And then I incorporated indigenous resilience into the coding decisions for the suitability analysis, such as their maintenance of a relationship with ecosystems, high social cohesion, and collective management of resources that informed the selection of areas that have high, highly arable land um, that are not near other community settlements and that um, are close enough to sunblast that they allow proper um, transportation to even be possible. So the following is a sea level rise model you, you done in ArcGIS uh, from my it, the inputs of an increased sea level rise. So we can see here that by 2050 on the like leftmost image uh, that the majority of the islands in the Sandblast region will be in fully inundated. And then by 2300, we see the mainland start to become significantly inundated and all of the islands be underwater. So this was meant to serve kind of as a visual representation both for the Panamanian government and for you know general literature that um, this problem is going to be uh, extremely upcoming and is something emergent to plan for. So particularly the impact of storm surges as you can see like amplifies the effects of flooding up to 2300 um, and will essentially devastate these islands based off of my predictions. So here's a short animation of what flooding will likely do to the like Panama, Panama mainland. Um, and we can see that like the flooding significantly impacts coasts. And this was interpreted in the suitability analysis to restrict areas of like relocation as well. So I did also did a case study on Gardi Subdiv, which is a small um, island that has over 2000 people living on it um, and predicted through the models what sea level rise will do to the island in 2050 and in 2100. Um, we can see from the first image on the left that 36% of houses are underwater. This equates to about 720 people being displaced. And by 2100, almost all of the island is underwater. So this problem is definitely um, something that is extremely emergent for these people. So the final outcome of this analysis and like the key deliverable here is a suitability map that determines potential relocation um, for the sandblast for the people who live on the San Blas Islands. So I've demarcated the San Blas Airport just to offer some kind of georeferencing there. Um, and essentially the, this locates the areas kind of to the east of Panama City, which I don't know if you can see my cursor, are around here um, as being most viable for relocation. So the key findings of this study were that the Gardi Sugdub and the majority of islands will be likely forced to migrate by 2050 under all RCP scenarios and that Eastern infrastructure is most at risk on this on in Gardi Sugdub particularly. And secondarily, 
Under both um, RCP scenarios, the majority of islands are at risk by 2050 and by 2300, the mainland will be impacted. This is particularly relevant because current relocation projects um, suggest that the Gunayala should simply relocate to their like indigenous mainland, which is about 100 kilometers away from where they currently live. Um, but we can see that this is not a long term solution based off of um, these current climate projections. And that storms, we lastly see that storm surges will flood all 400 plus islands that are in San Blas right now. Um, and that even if this happens before the sea level rise eventually inundates the entire island, that storm surges will likely devastate infrastructure to the point at which migration will have to occur anyway. So the other findings um, specifically related to my like, key deliverable of a suitability analysis are that four in, uh, specific districts offer the highest suitability based off of socio-ecological factors. Um, so those are Panama, Chepo, Chiman, and San Miguelito. And I think it's important to note here that these areas all present um, a, like areas that are viable, not just in terms of their like ecology, such as their ability for arable land, access to electricity, um, away from, that they're away from other communities, but they also capture, um, at least in part, the indigenous resilience of this community by allowing them and empowering them to be autonomous even after um, they're forced to migrate away from their initial homes. And I think that is kind of the thematic um, like, like su summary of my research, which is um, climate migration. It's not just driven by governments, driven by um, like general research that we, we can apply to specific areas, but research that's useful for these groups in particular, um, th their local governments, as well as the Guna's indi indigenous government to plan for their own relocation. And I think that um, my research kind of in my actual thesis summarizes the literature's um, lack of focus on the autonomy of these people and hopefully through increased um, initiatives that support their autonomy, we can offer not just solutions that help them overcome the effects of climate change, but help them do so together and proactively before they're forced to kind of move um, and not able to plan. Yeah, thank you. If you have any questions, let me know. Well done, Ariana. I have a question. Uh, what are the key parameters that you are most sure of and most unsure of that you feed into your sea rise level model? You have two basically scenarios um, um, in order for us mere mortals to understand it. Can you just give us a, a brief idea? Thank yes. you. So um, the sea level rise scenarios are based off of IPCC reports on um, what they predict sea level rise to look like based off of a variety of different factors. Um, I think that these, these estimates are based off of global mean sea level rise. They're not specific to the Caribbean Sea. So um, we ex I expect that these estimations of sea level rise are actually rather conservative, um, considering the fact that the equatorial adjacent area in the Caribbean Sea is likely to result in more thermal expansion, higher um, fluctuations with tropical storms and things like that. Um, these predictions, I think RCP 8.5, even though it's seen as more of a, like, like the, probably the worst scenario, um, is actually more realistic, significantly more realistic than the conservative estimate of 2.6. Anyone else from the um, audience or, um, let's see. They're giving you praise. <laughs> so I think if you have more questions for Ariana and it's been working really well, put them in the chat and then Ariana will go through and answer them. It's hard to do everything in real time. So that's a, a great way to do it. Thank you so, so much and well done. Thank you. I will ask Jerry please to uh, come up and share his work on his thesis. If you share your screen, I think Ariana will unshare automatically, Jerry. Yeah, is it working? Perfect. You can yeah. do it in full screen. Yes, perfect. Mm -hmm. 
Hi everyone, today I'm sharing my thesis on the effect of California wildfires on perceived fire risks and home values. So we did a case study of Santa Clarita Valley after multiple fires in the time period of the study. I really want to give special thanks to my uh, mentor, Professor Sofia Villas-Boas for supporting me and encouraging me to turn my small idea into my thesis. So first off, let me- Can I stop you, Jerry? Mm -hmm. Can I stop you, Jerry? Yeah. Can you share with the group how we you asked me to do this? Oh yeah, I was just, um, I was in Sophia's class and I was like, yeah, I was thinking about this little project and then we were talking about it on her way back to her office and it was just really casual and really like the vibes that like the, how like professors and students can be so close and just talk about like what you have in your mind and maybe we can turn this into an honor thesis. Yeah, yeah, so Jerry, encourage the, the people from high school watching right now to be brave and approach the faculty when they join Berkeley, right? We don't bite. Yeah, it's just like a small talk and, and like a small casual chat after class or on the way to the professor's office and you can really get a lot from like just the chat itself. Yeah, should I um, continue? Thank you, Jerry. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> No problem. Yeah, so before I start, I just want to give a quick background and the history of California wildfires. So in fact, California wildfires, um, especially in the Western United States, are not news to us. They happen prehistorically all the time before the population boom, and they have been shaping the ecosystem in California for thousands of years. And lightning has been identified as the major cause of wildfires in the Western United States prehistorically. From the graph on the left, we can see that over the past 1500 years here, the fire frequency is going down as indicated by the purple um, line in part D. Uh, and now we're at, actually at a trough of fire frequencies. However, what is alarming is we have reached a record high in terms of temperature in the past 200 years. And also in part C, we can see that in biomass burning, we have accumulated a, a record high of fire deficit, which just means accumulating excess fuels for the next big fire to explode. And this will pose a huge fire risk for the 21st century. And indeed, we do see an increase in fire frequency and severity recently. And the fires in the past several years have been record setting, not necessarily in terms of size, but definitely in terms of costs and its damage to human, to human lives. So we can see from the table on the left, out of the top 10 costliest wildfires in the United States, all of them are in California. And all of them happened after the year 2000. And six of them happened in the past five years. And this table was even made before the fire season of 2020, the year we observed the largest fire season. Um, in the recent history. So if the year of 2020 data were included, the figures would even be more astonishing. And uh, for example, the fire in 2018, um, the campfire destroyed the entire town of paradise, which was super tragic. And this was the first time we've seen uh, such a big impact to human lives of the wildfires. So this raises the question that why the recent fires have been so costly and severe? Well, the first part of it is due to the accumulated fire deficit in the late 20th century due to the fire suppression policies in the United States. Another huge part is due to the increasing human interactions with the wildlands by moving into WUI. WUI, which stands for the Wildland Urban Interface and Intermix. Here's an example in the graph on the left, as you can see from part A and part B and this, um, the leftmost graph. Um, both types of WIs have large area where many houses and wildland vegetation intermingle, which provides no barrier but excess fuels when the area is hit by a wildfire. What's even worse is in California, we see the number of homes in WI areas grew by 33% from 1990 to 2010. On one hand, people are moving into the WI areas. On the other hand, um, the fire um, informations and the fire damages have been making the headlines of the newspapers and the um, 
interviews on the television. So this motivated our research question. Are people actually aware of the fire risks when they decide um, to purchase a home? So for this study, we look at a case study in Santa Clarita Valley, which is uh, on, on the map you can see, is um, right above San Fernando in the red um, area here. It's surrounded um, by mountains uh, to, the, to the east, to the west, and to the north. So that would be a, a perfect area for us to study. And also it has been a rapidly developing WIs um, before the time of the study and was hit by multiple fires in the time frame of the study. And for the control group we're looking at, we actually did not choose the city of San Fernando because it was very close to two of the fires we we're looking at. And we don't want the control group to be secretly treated and alter our um, evaluation of the fire on housing values. So instead, we choose the little bit further city of Burbank, um, which is also a very good control group because it's right next to some other mountains, which makes it um, also a part of the WI. So we're controlling for something that are both changing in that time frame when um, the houses were expanding into the WI areas. And also we looked at the city of Pasadena, which I will mention a little bit later. So the data and, um, is acquired from Zillow, especially the housing transaction and sales data with the house characteristics and the fire information are acquired from Cal Fire. Oh, sorry. The study uses a difference in differences research method that compares if the fire leads to a differential trend in the trajectory of housing prices in Santa Clarita compared to in Burbank. So we're controlling for the city specific effects and then the time specific effects. We only wanna look at uh, how the fire changes the slope of the price trajectory uh, in different groups, the treatment and the control. So Santa Clarita has experienced multiple fires during the time frame of the study, which makes it perfect to study um, the evolution of people's perceived fire, risk, fire risks and then see if they actually adjust their perceived risk based on a huge fire event. So here are the summary of the fires happened during the study time. So in 2003, we had the Simi fire, which burned approximately 100,000 fires. In 2004, we have Foothill fire, which burned approximately 6,000 acres. In 2007, we had two major fires, Buckwheat and Magic Fire right next to Santa Clarita, which burned around 41,000 acres. And in 2008, we have Sarah Fire, which burned around 11,000 acres. So under the difference and differences model assumption, the price trend in both the treatment group, uh, Santa Clarita, and the control group, Burbank, would have evolved similarly had it not been fire. So if not for the fire, then we should see the same price trend. So we can make sure all the um, changes in housing trends are represented by the fire. As we can tell from the left part of this graph, this does look true um, before the fire. It seems like those two housing trends, trends has been following quite similarly. And in the fire years 2004, let's look at the following year 2005, we see a deeper drop. Um, and also in the fire years 2003, and, and five, we see in those two years, there's a deeper drop uh, in slopes compared to in the red line Burbank. And for the um, fire years 2008 and 2009, we see a flatter increase in the housing price trend compared to Burbank. And then for the model result, here is the regression um, table that uh, we did. So the first two uh, columns indicates the linear model and the third and fourth column uh, indicate the log transform model, which allows the, um, the marginal effect of the fire to vary depending on the levels of the covariates. So for the linear model, um, we included a lot of covariates like um, the housing characteristics, like the lot size, year built, a number of bedrooms and number of bathrooms, which are common um, factors that people consider when con purchasing a home. And we also included fires and the interaction of treatment and fires. What we want to focus here is um, in the interaction terms. So for the interaction terms, we concluded that holding other variables constant, semi-fire would reduce housing price by on average 40K and buckwheat magic fire reduced the housing price by around 50K and sale fire reduced the housing price by around 31K. 
and all at the significance level of 1%. For the log transform model, we see um, the semi fire reduced by um, housing price by 6%, buckwheat and magic fire reduced the housing price by 7%, and syrup price reduced the housing price by 3%, all at the significance level of 1%. So the foothill fire's effect on housing prices is actually very small and statistically insignificant. To test the validity of the model, um, the city of Pasadena is chosen as the fake treatment group because it's obviously not affected by the fires and, if it, and it is geographically close to the treatment and the control group. So if the model is right, then we should not pick up any of the fire effects on the interaction terms which is indeed true because we can see here, um, the small exception is the buckwheat fire and magic fire in column two at the uh, significance level of 10%, all other coefficients are not statistically significant. So for, a con oh, for the conclusion, so from the case study of Santa Clarita Valley, we can see that the fire risks have not been priced into the housing values. And we see an average drop of 5% of the housing values after, after a severe fire. However, we do see learning that people are adjusting their perceived fire risks after a major fire. For example, Foothill Fire had no statistically significant effects on housing values after a semi-fire in the previous year. This leads us to hypothesize that after a big fire of Simi, which burned 10,000, um, 100,000 uh, acres, a smaller fire like Foothill, which only burned 6,000 acres, has no effect on housing prices. However, the effects of the fire seem to be uh, diminishing um, up two years after the fire. But after several years of no fire, another severe fire will lead to a bigger drop in price compared to the previous one. That's all I have to present and thank you so much for your attention. Good job, Jerry. We have time for one quick question. Anyone in the audience? Brian, you have a question? Not really, it's a very nice presentation. <laughs> all right, Jerry, if, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat for Jerry. Um, very well done. And um, looking forward to seeing your next, um, in, you know, next steps on your project. I, I do have one one question, which is: this seems to show that the effects of fires are fairly local, right? They don't they don't uh, uh, transcend uh, local boundaries very much, and you know, make implications for other similar areas that maybe are not close. Yes, this the from the case study of Santa Clarita fires, uh, Santa Clarita fires that this seems like the case. Maybe one hypothesis is also not because of the fire risk. Maybe it's also because of the loss of uh, environmental amenities. For example, if there is a huge burn scar on the mountain, then the nearby city is not going to see it, but the closest city is going to be constantly seeing it every time they go out of their homes. So maybe that's also a huge com uh, contribution to the reduction of housing values. Thank you. And now, last but not least, Yanling Liu, you have the floor and your advisors in the house. And uh, we are looking forward to listening to your thesis presentation. Yeah, hello everyone. Could you guys see my screen? Cool. Um, hello everyone. Today I'll be talking about my research around bioplastic, which is petrochemical plastic substitutes. And I will be talking about its price burden and its path to cost reduction. Um, huge shout out to my faculty mentor, Professor Brian Ray. Thank you so much for all the guidance along the way. Yeah, to begin, um, I would like to give a couple definitions about the bioplastic and bioplastic products that we'll be talking about in this research. So for bioplastic, I'll be referring to biodegradable probe plastics that are mostly but not all made from renewable resources. And for bioplastic products, I'll be talking about um, are referring to products made primarily from bioplastic that are certified biodegradable or compostable. So this research originated from an identified problem, which is that 1% of 335 million tons of plastics produced annually are bioplastics. After more than 30 years of development of bioplastic in an industry, why is its market still so small? Um, to answer 
To resolve this problem, I focus on the price and cost size of bioplastic, and I'll be answering three questions. The first one is that is price a disadvantage to them? And if so, what price reducing technology or innovations is being adopted to reduce the cost of bioplastics? In addition to that, what other indirect methods could be um, could help to mitigate the cost reduction burden of bioplastics? To begin with, in order to identify the price burden of bioplastic products, I picked Biobag as a representative. Um, Biobag is a global company that produces compostable and biodegradable packaging products. I picked their kitchen waste bag, gallon zipper food storage bag, plastic shopping bag, and produce bag as example, and compared their prices to its competitors um, that are conventional plastic products. And I found that on average, their price Biobag's prices are on average 2.9 times higher than its peers. Based off of this finding, um, I reached out to Biobag's representative and another uh, bioplastic product company. Um, I asked about their cost disadvantage in the market and Biobag responded that their main component nature bite, which is made primarily from starches, cellulose, um, vegetable oils and their combinations, the main component just have a higher raw material cost than other petrochemical plastic. Even as the demand for Biobag increased, price of nature bite has reduced. However, it may never be as inexpensive as polyethylene, which is the main material found in other plastic bags. In addition, I reached out to a company based in Hong Kong called Distinctive Action. They produce a uh, product called Invisible Bag, which is biodegradable, compostable, and water soluble. The main component of Invisible Bag is polyvinyl alcohol, starch, glycerin, water, and the use eco-friendly inks. Uh, their founder confirmed that two to three times price difference um, would exist for their product as well in Hong Kong, and it may be even worse in their case, as economies of volume is hard for them to achieve. They mainly sell to middle and small sizes businesses, as larger size businesses don't tend to purchase these environmentally friendly products that are more pricey. After I found, um, after talking to the companies and founding the price difference in bioproducts, um, I realized that the main price difference comes from their main, uh, their raw materials. Therefore, I went on and researched on the raw material prices of bioplastic materials. All the materials are listed on the left side and the biodegradability is labeled um, as one if they're biodegradable, it's zero if they're not. We can see that the most expensive material is a biodegradable one called um, PHA and biobacks main material, may turbide, is indeed more expensive than polyethylene. Another interesting point to look at is PLA, um, polylactic acid, is actually, um, uh, sorry, PVA, polyvinyl alcohol, which is uh, adopted by distinctive action, is actually slightly cheaper than polyethylene. Um, however, the price may be adjusted um, based on if it's retail price or wholesale price, and price, may, uh, price difference may exist due to different regions as well. But overall, um, the biodegradable materials, bioplastic materials are overall cheaper than PVC, PP, and PET. After we've identified the price differences, the next question to ask is what price reducing technologies, cost reducing technologies exist for bioplastic materials? I'll be taking two examples. The first one is polylactic acid, PLA. PLA is mainly made from starch, and starch goes through hydrolysis, fermentation, and eventually condensation in order to form PLA. In order to reduce the price of PLA, um, it's suggested to blend PLA composite with PLA with sisal fibers to form a cheaper composite. Since sisal fiber is a very abundant natural fiber resource, blending it would not um, only reduce its price, but would also improve its mechanical properties, such as lower melting point, making PLA composite easier to be processed. Uh, in addition to that, high, higher tensile strength and a higher biodegradation rate. Another example I'll talk about is polyhydroxyalkanoate, PHA. So PHA's price mainly come from its production cost. Um, so during its production, bacteria are used. These bacteria used are called alkalogens and they mainly come from sugar or lipids. These bacteria are first grown with nutrients such as carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and salt. And after they're grown, they undergo fermentation with unbalanced conditions, which means not enough um, nutrients in order to produce pH weight within themselves for storage of carbon and um, energy. And afterwards, pH is being extracted and purified. 
So in order to reduce price of PHA, two process within the production can be tackled. The first one is we can choose cheaper carbon substrate to reduce the cost of biosynthesis. In addition to sugar, we can use plant oil instead, um, such as soybean palm or corn oil. In addition, PHA can also be produced using waste streams, um, solid waste, and sludge. Other than the carbon substrate used to produce by PHA, we can also tackle the extraction process. The extraction process contributes to 30 to 50% of total production cost of PHA. Um, in order to increase the yield and potentially decrease the cost, we can use non-ionic surfactants as pretreatment to extraction of PHA. This would increase the recovery yield of PHA and it will provide a comparable yield as using chlorinated solvents. Besides um, cost-reducing technology to produce bioplastic material, other innovations exist in the industry to trying to produce cheaper plastic replacement. Um, two case studies will be discussed here. The first one is UBQ and the second one is new light technologies. So UBQ provide a biodegradable plastic replacement called UBQ material. And the way um, they reduce cost is that the patented modular conversion system they invented can convert any residual municipal solid waste into UBQ material. As the solid waste is an ever-growing and cheaper source, um, the UBQ company even promised that their client would not pay a penny more than their existing resin if they convert to UBQ material. Currently, UBQ material is being used by McDonald's as their trays and Central Virginia Waste Management Authority in the U.S. also um, purchase UBQ made recycling beans. In addition, New Light Technologies develop a material called air carbon. Air carbon is a PHA based thermoplastic. So, um, air, uh, New Light Technologies developed a microorganism based biocatalyst that provide nine times higher polymer conversion yield than previous conversion technology from methane to PHA. So, the way they reduce cost is by increasing yield of the conversion rate. Um, and currently air carbon is being used in footwear as well as fashion industry. Besides um, the, direct the direct cost reducing um, solutions in order to have uh, lower cost production and, and also increasing yields, um, I also suggest other indirect uh, ways to mitigate the cost burden of bioplastic companies. The first one is Companies could target customers' higher willingness to pay for a more environmentally um, and green products. Um, and the customers' higher willingness to pay for these kind of products are being researched in many papers um, as listed in the presentation. Um, in addition to that, companies could also create market opportunities through educating its customers and collaborating with its customers. For example, one um, Kling, in, Kling and others in Germany researched on participants' um, preference for bio-based apparel, and they found that out of the participants, only 12% of them had experience with bioplastics, while previous experience with bioplastics would improve, uh, increase their preference for bio-based apparel. Therefore, we can see the importance of educating uh, the customers and more exposure of bioplastic products to customers is needed here. In addition, IELTS and others um, was researching on sustainable business models for chemical companies. They also argue that reducing cost and increasing yields are not enough to secure success of bioplastics. Um, out of the case studies they conducted, DuPont from US, um, in order to identify potential applications and customer needs, of the bioplastics they produce, they communicated with their downstream manufacturers in order to do that. In addition, they created EcoLabel as a device for downstream manufacturers to show their consumers the material's ecological values in order to boost sales. Um, in order, uh, other than that, I think uh, IELTS also uh, suggested that companies could monitor bioplastic improvement and communicate the progress to societies. So we can see the importance of educating customers and collaborating in order to achieve more market opportunities and largest market and eventually reach economies of scale and indirectly reduce cost. Yeah, so that's an overview of my research. And here's the conclusion. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm really, uh, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Please unmute if you have a question. Nice, nice job, Youngling. Uh, this is Brian. Um, what do you think is the prospects for UBQ actually becoming an important competitor in the plastic market? 
places like McDonald's. Yeah, absolutely. Um, UBQ is an Israeli company and they're trying to enlarge their market in the US. I think um, they are developing many applications of, their, of the UBQ material um, in order to enlarge its market. So I think application is a really important um, the more application it is, the more market opportunities they would have. I think currently the cost for UBQ material is already, um, uh, because they have been achieving um, lower cost based off of cheaper raw material, the only thing they need to achieve is economies of scale if they can produce um, UBQ material in a larger bulk. So if that's the case, then they would really be able to reduce their price and appeal to more customers. Thanks. Thank you. So we have a question from the audience from Grace, um, whether your thesis will be available and the answer is yes. Um, Anna has uh, uh, created an, a spectacular website in, in the college website with all the thesis from previous years and we will proudly add the thesis from these eight amazing honor students this fall semester as well. And so you can have an idea of what a deliverable looks like and also add some of the PowerPoint presentations with your permissions. We'll ask that afterwards, if that's okay with you all. 